Hello and welcome to the Hot Rod Bible Study, where tonight we are continuing our study in Acts chapter 9. Last week we saw the radical change in uh, Saul of Tarsus, as well as uh, a, an Ethiopian eunuch coming to Jesus, which affected uh, the entire area of uh, Northern Africa uh, greatly. Uh, so it's interesting tonight we continue on seeing the radical change with Saul of Tarsus, and there's a lot to look at tonight. So without further ado, let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you again for this time we get to be together and studying your word. And again, thank you for your word for us to study. Please uh, open our hearts and our minds to your word. Uh, send your Holy Spirit upon us this evening. Uh, that will help us in that. And Lord, as always, keep me from getting in the way. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, Acts chapter 9, beginning at the 10th verse, says... Now there was a certain disciple in Damascus named Ananias. And to him the Lord said in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Here I am, Lord. So the Lord said to him, Arise and go to the street called Straight and inquire at the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he is praying. And in a vision he has seen a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hands on him so that he might receive his sight. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has the authority from the chief priests to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. For I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. And Ananias went his way and entered the house. And laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you came, has sent me that you may, may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales, and he received his sight at once, and he rose and was baptized. So when he had received food, he was strengthened. Then Saul spent some days with the disciples in Damascus. Immediately he preached the Christ in the synagogues, that he is the Son of God. And all who heard were amazed and said, Is this not he who destroyed those who called on this name in Jerusalem and has come here for that purpose, so that he might bring them bound to the chief priests? But Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who dwelt in Damascus, proving that this Jesus is the Christ. Now after many days were passed, the Jews plotted to kill him. But their plot became known to Saul and they watched the gates day and night to kill him. Then the disciples took him by night and led him down through the wall in a large basket. And when Saul had come to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were afraid of him and did not believe that he was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the disciples, and he declared to them how he had seen the Lord on the road, and how he had spoken to him, and how he preached boldly in Damascus in the name of Jesus. So he was with them in Jerusalem, coming in and going out, and he spoke boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus and disputed against the Hellenists. But they attempted to kill him. When the brethren found out, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him out to Tarsus. Then the churches throughout all Judea, Galilee, and Samaria had peace and were edified. And they were walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit. They were multiplying. Now it came to pass, as Peter went through all the parts of the country, he also came down to the 
came down to the saints who dwell in Lydda. There, he found a certain man named Ananias, pardon me, Aeneas, who had been bedridden for eight years and paralyzed. Peter said to him, Aeneas, Jesus the Christ heals you. Arise and make your bed. Then he rose immediately, so all who dwelt in Lydda and Sharon saw him and turned to the Lord. At Joppa there was a certain disciple named Tabitha, which is translated Dorcas. This woman was full of good works and charitable deeds which she did. But it happened in those days that she became sick and died. When they had washed her, they laid her in the upper room. And since Lydda was near Joppa and the disciples had heard that Peter was there, they sent two men to him, imploring him not to delay in coming to them. Then Peter arose, went with them. And he, when he had come, they brought him to the upper room. And all the widows stood by him weeping, showing the tunics and the garments which Dorcas had made while she was with them. But Peter put them all out. He knelt down and prayed, and turning the body, he said, Tabitha, arise. And she opened her eyes, and when she saw Peter, she sat up, and he gave her his hand and lifted her up. And when he had called the saints and the widows, he presented her alive. And it came known throughout all of Joppa, and many believed in the Lord. So that so it was that he stayed many days in Joppa with Simon, pardon me, Simon, a tanner. Now that's a lot to go through, but uh, we're going to hit it hard. All right. Verse 10, certain disciple in Damascus named Ananias. Now this, he was a regular guy. He was not an apostle nor an evangelist, just a regular guy. And to him, the Lord said in a vision, Ananias. Now it was probably more of a still small voice instead of the slap you upside the head and blind you with light uh, sort of a deal that happened to uh, our hero Saul of Tarsus. So here he replies, Ananias says, he said, here I am, Lord. Reminds me of Samuel in the book of 1 Samuel in the Old Testament. Samuel was dedicated uh, as a priest. His mom, Hannah, did this, and he was living there with uh, Eli, the high priest. And in the middle of the night, Samuel keeps hearing his voice calling him Samuel. And he goes into, you know, Eli, and Eli says, Yep, I didn't call you. Keeps going. Finally, Eli recognizes that it's the Lord. And so he says, Tell you what, you know, here I am, Lord. And that's what Ananias is doing here. Here I am. That's what it's a great example for us. When we hear the Lord call us to doing something, we ought to say, here I am, Lord. Whether it seems like something we ought to, that we're capable of doing or not, it's something we ought to do. Verse 11 says, So the Lord said to him, Arise, go to the street called Straight, and inquire at the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. The Lord was very specific on where and whom Ananias was to minister. Now, it says, for behold, he is praying. Now, it, it made me wonder this. I wonder how his prayers were different after he came to Jesus. Because remember, he was a Pharisee. And he was sure trained on all the specific prayers are laid out for the day and all that. What was his prayer life like after coming to Jesus? Just a thought, kind of interesting. Now, verse 12 says, And in a vision he has seen a man named Ananias coming and putting his hands on him so that he might receive his sight. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I've heard about, I heard from many about this man, how he has, how much, pardon me, harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. He said, no, wait a minute. I know this guy is one mean motor scooter, and I don't necessarily want to put myself in that area. But, verse 14, and, oh, I'm sorry, verse 14, he continues to say, and here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. All of those who were of the way, remember, early name for Christians, 
those of the way knew exactly what Saul had been doing. And again, this guy's a mean motor scooter, and they don't want anything to do with him. Now, verse 15, but the Lord said to him, said Ananias, go for he is a chosen vessel of mine. God chooses the most unlikely people for his vessels to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and children of Israel. For I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. No longer having uh, all the rights and privileges that he had as a Pharisee. Okay. Now, again, God uses the most unlikely of us for his purposes. Um, can you imagine a Pharisee called to preach the gospel to Gentiles? Remember, Jews didn't much care for Gentiles. And Pharisees were those pretty hot dog uh, people, of, as my friend Greg Opine would say, the religious mafia, right? Call on him. It's just as <laughs> most unlikely a hot rodder called to preach the, the gospel to. Same thing. God calls on the most unlikely to do these things. Now, verse 17, and Ananias went on his way, entered the house, laying hands on him, said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you came, sent me that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Okay, now, Ananias did exactly what God had called him to do by entering the house, laying hands on him. That is the conference of this healing that he was called to do. Now, and what does he do? He calls him Brother Saul, already a brother in Christ. Okay, remember, Ananias isn't so sure about this, but God reassures him, so okay, you say he's a brother in Christ, God. He's a brother in Christ. So he goes on to say, Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you came, has sent me that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. So not only was he cured of physical blindness, but spiritual blindness as well. Huh. Verse 18. Immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales, and he received his sight at once, and he rose and was baptized again, radically changed by Jesus Christ. Now, verse 19, so when he received food, he was strengthened. Remember back in verse 9, he hadn't eaten for three days. Then Saul spent some days with the disciples at Damascus. Uh, remember, he initially had come with papers to imprison these guys, and now he's hanging out with them. <laughs> what a change, what a change. Verse 20, immediately he preached the Christ in the synagogues. You know, he was a well-known student of a well-known rabbi, Gamaliel, okay? And so he would have been, and being a Pharisee, he would have been invited to preach in their synagogues, okay? So, so immediately he preached the Christ in the synagogue, said he is the son of God. And all who heard this were amazed. I wrote down flabbergasted, you know, be kind of like, whoa, what are you guys, what's going on here? And they said, is it not he who destroyed those who called on this name, the name of Jesus, in Jerusalem and has come for that purpose so that he might bring them down to the chief priest? These guys knew that Paul had these papers to come grab these guys and bring them back and prosecute them for blasphemy. And again, the sentence for blasphemy is death. Okay, so they knew exactly what he was doing. It says here in verse 22, but Saul increased all the more in strength. Um, the New Living Translation says his preaching became more powerful and confounded the Jews who dwelt in Damascus, proving that Jesus is the Christ. Now, how did he do that? Through Scripture, just as Peter did back in chapter 8, to the Ethiopian, Ethiopian eunuch, using scripture to prove Jesus as the Christ. Verse 23, 
Now, after many days were passed, the Jews plotted to kill him. Let's look at Galatians chapter 1, verses 13 through 18, where it says, For you have heard of my former conduct in Judaism. This is, this is now Paul and Saul speaking. He says, How I persecuted the church of God beyond measure and tried to destroy it. And I advanced in Judaism beyond many of the contemporaries in my own nation, being more exceedingly zealous for the traditions of my fathers. But when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me through his grace to reveal his son in me, that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately confer with flesh and blood, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me. But I went to Arabia and returned again to Damascus. Then after three years, this is the talk about many days passing, three years, I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and remained with him 15 days. So that's quite a while, three years. Then it said that the Jews plotted to kill him. All right? Okay, let's go back to, to 9 verse 16. What does it say? What, is, what does God tell Ananias? For I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. He had to suffer the fact that people were plotting to kill him. Now, verse 24, their plot became known to Saul. And they watched the gates day and night to kill him. Then the disciples, again, these are the guys he first came to persecute, now that they're friends, okay, took him by night and led him down through the wall in a large basket. James Boyce puts it this way. It was the beginning of many escapes for Paul. Sometimes he didn't quite escape. Sometimes they caught him, imprisoned him, and beat him. And he did indeed suffer many things for Jesus' sake. Now, verse 26 and when Saul had come to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were afraid of him and did not believe he was a disciple. You know, again, his reputation preceded him as one mean motor scooter. And remember, who was there overseeing the stoning of Stephen, the first Christian martyr? Well, Saul of Tarsus. But this is after, this is after three years, right? Okay, but Barnabas, remember his name means encouragement. He was a guy back in chapter 4 that sold his property and gave it to the, the proceeds of it to the uh, disciples there, the apostles. Okay, so this guy was a man of God who, uh, again, uh, was an encourager and a real blessing to everybody. Now, it says Barnabas brought in to the apostles, brought Saul. And he, Saul, declared to them how he had seen the Lord on the road and they had spoken to him. And he preached how he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus, testifying to his radical change. So when he was with them in Jerusalem, coming and going out. We're going back to Galatians and we're going to read... Verse 18 again, then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and remained with them for 15 days. 19 says, but I saw none of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother. Okay, so he was coming and going out of here, hanging out with, with, uh, with Peter and with James. Now, Verse 29, he spoke boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus and disputed against the Hellenists. Remember, we've heard about the Hellenists before. They're the Greek-speaking Jews. Uh, and here he is pretty much picking up where Stephen left off. <laughs> pretty interesting how that worked out. Now, remember, Paul's mother was a Jew. His dad was a Roman citizen. So he could speak Greek and Hebrew and probably more in, uh, languages than that. I don't want to say that for certain. Now, verse 30 says, When the brethren found out, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him out to Tarsus. Now, let's look at this. Then Williams, Williams puts it this way. Tarsus was one of the great cities of the ancient world. 
with an excellent harbor and strategic placement at trade routes. It was especially known as a university city, being one of the three great educational cities in the Mediterranean world. Strabo, who was a first century Greek geographer, philosopher, and historian, speaks of the Tarsinian University as even surpassing in some respects of those of Athens and Alexandria. It was especially important as a center of Stoic philosophy. Okay, so this is a big time town. Now, Tarsus, uh, Saul, pardon me, Saul was of Tarsus, the young, check it out, the young, successful, energetic rabbi. He was Saul the persecutor, then Saul the blind. He became Saul the convert, and then Saul the preacher. Yet he became Paul the apostle, he spent between eight and 12 years as Saul the unknown, okay? Those were not wasted years. They were good and necessary years. So here we have Saul making this radical change, although overnight it moved many years before he really got into being the uh, arguably the greatest um, evangelist to ever walk this earth and walk, I mean, Literally. Now, verse 31, Then the churches throughout all Judea, Galilee, and Samaria had peace and were edified and were walking in the fear of the Lord and the comfort, paraclesis, the comforter, Greek, okay, of the Holy Spirit, and they were multiplied again. It's exponential growth in the church. The book of Acts shows us time and time again the exponential growth in the church with the receiving of the Holy Spirit. Now, it came to pass, as Peter went through all the parts of the country, that he also came down to the saints who dwelled in Lydda. Now, that's about 35 miles northwest of Jerusalem. It's currently the site of Manjuron Airport, just outside of Tel Aviv. So this is still there. Okay. Now, there he found, by the direction of God, a certain man named Aeneas, who had been bedridden eight years and was paralyzed. Peter said to him, Aeneas, Jesus the Christ heals you. Arise and make your bed. Just as Jesus said to the paralytic, right, in Mark chapter 2. Hmm. So then he rose immediately. So all who dwelt in Lydda and Sharon, Sharon is the plain in which Lida is located, okay, saw him and turned to the Lord. Now, at Joppa, which is a coastal city, you may have heard of Joppa before if you're around for our study in Jonah. Joppa is the coastal city that Jonah got on the boat to split all over to Tarshish instead of going up to Nineveh to try and go, instead of going up uh, Northeast, he was going southwest to try and get away from doing this job, and uh, things didn't work out so well for him. He had a little bit of time in the ocean. Okay, so Joppa, there was a certain disciple named Tabitha, which is also translated Dorcas, which got one one is Hebrew, the other one is Greek, uh, means gazelle. Okay, so probably. Uh, a beautiful lady. Now, this woman was full of good works and charitable deeds, which she did. But it happened in those days that she became sick and died. And they washed her and laid her up in an upper room. This was a, a typical preparation for those who were of modest means. Uh, they would do that and lay her out for a bit, you know. And verse 38 says, And since Lida was near Joppa, and the disciples had heard that Peter was there. They sent two men to him, imploring him not to delay in coming to them. Um, you know, they had heard of all these miracles that uh, Peter had been performing. So they sent for Peter. And then Peter rose and went to them. When he had come, they brought him to the upper room. And all the widows stood by him weeping, showing the tunics and the garments which Dorcas had made while she was with him. Her works of charity. She was a seamstress of high class. Okay. Now, verse 40. 
But Peter put them all out, knelt down and prayed. Turning to the body, he said, Tabitha, arise, or Tabitha, kumai. The same thing that Jesus did with the daughter of Jairus. It was Talitha, and Jesus said, Talitha, kumai, means Talitha, arise. Interesting to note that Peter was one of the three who were there that witnessed Jesus doing this. So Peter is doing the same thing here. And same result. And she opened her eyes and she saw Peter. She sat up. Then they gave her his hand and lifted her up. And he called the saints and widows. Uh, saints. You know, this is something... And depending upon which uh, church, uh, oh, you grew up in, and I was, I was trying to say um, community that you grew up in, you've heard of saints, you know, where they, maybe the, um, um, well, I'm having words escape me. Yeah, you know, got all these different saints, but you know, the saints are. Those of us who are washed in the blood of Jesus. Uh, at that time, it was the same thing. I heard a really great sermon by uh, Pastor Lowell Seabrass, one of the guys that was uh, uh, a great mentor of mine, and I didn't really realize he was mentoring me at the time. Uh, but he said about that, he says, you know, it's... There's, you, you don't have to be uh, beatified. That's what the word I was looking for, to be a saint. It's not you are a saint because you're washed in the blood of Jesus. He said, yeah, you know, there could even be a, you're even St. Willie, just because, you know, St. Saint, Saint Tom, St. Saint Mark, Saint, you know, all these different people that we know, all of us who have been saved by the blood of Jesus and recognize us, we're all saints. And again, it's not by our good works. <laughs> if it was by our good works, Jesus wouldn't have had to pay the price for our sins on the cross. We are saints through the blood of Jesus. Remember that. Now, it said, and he called, had called the saints and widows, and he presented her, Dorcas, alive. And it became known throughout all of Joppa, and many believed on the Lord hearing, again, of the Lord's power. You know, it wasn't Peter who, uh, well, revived her. It was not Peter who revived her. It was Jesus using Peter. Just as, just as uh, Dr. Luke being the one writing this book, he didn't do it on his lonesome. God used him. All the books, all the 66 books in the Bible, God used the authors to write these things. They didn't just come up on it on their own. Now, verse 43. So it was that he, he Peter, stayed many days in Joppa with Simon, a tanner. Now, why would they have that? Why would Luke write that down? What, what is so important about Simon being a tanner? Well, here we go. According to the laws of that time, a tanner had to leave, live at least 75 feet out of the, outside a village because of his constant ritual uncleanliness. Okay, and G. Campbell Morgan put it this way, the trade of a tanner was held in such supreme contempt that if a girl was betrothed to a tanner without knowing that he followed that calling, the betrothal was void. So again, they weren't high in, you know, they were, they were probably thought of worse than shepherds. Remember, shepherds were not allowed to uh, testify in court. Now, if you're a tanner, I think things were worse. But here we have Peter, man of God, apostle, called by Christ, staying with a lowly tanner dude. That's why it's in there. Okay, now. Questions, comments, smart aleck remarks? I see a, a shake of the head that no, there aren't any. If you do, please uh, get a hold of me uh, either through the Facebook page or through 
the website, which is uh, hotrodbiblestudy.com. Uh, I'm easy to get a hold of. If I say something that's wonky, please uh, talk to me about it. Um, and because, again, I, <laughs> I'm certainly not infallible. Uh, one more thing I'd like to mention is in two weeks, we will be having the hot rod study on a Wednesday night. That's the 22nd of May, as Pam and I will be in route on the 23rd, that Thursday. So write that down. I'll also obviously uh, promote it on, on the Facebook page and all, that it will be on Wednesday, the 22nd. Something unusual, but that's good. Uh, and with that, uh, may the peace of God that transcends all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. And there's nothing you can do. It has to, it 